Yeah, please start. We are running late. OK. Uh, my voice is clear, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so hi, I'm Shumon uh, and I'm from Team 6 Hyperthreads and today I'll be talking about this paper, uh, improving the utilization of micro operation caches in x86 processors. And just to note, some of the figures are adapted and modified from the paper itself. Yeah, so this is the plan of the presentation. First, we'll have a look into the background of what micro operation caches are and a bit of uh, uh, internal details and uh, then we look at the impact of micro operation caches uh, on performance and power reduction. And then we we'll motivate the problem like what is the problem with these micro operation caches, the inefficiencies. And uh, then we will we'll move into the solutions proposed by the paper. And finally we will conclude. Yeah, so this is the basic uh, overview of uh, the modern uh, x86 uh, CPU front end. And as we all know by now that uh, the front end uses a decoupled branch, uh, decoupled front end, and the branch predictor, uh, sorry, yeah, the branch predictor uh, generates a range of addresses which basically identifies a basic block. And this uh, range of addresses is also sometimes called a prediction window. So these range of addresses are uh, fed into the uh, fetch and decode unit. And uh, as we all know that uh, modern x86 processors uses a variable length CISC IASA and due to this fact the decoder is very power hungry. So after after the uh, decoder, uh, so the decoder gets the instructions from the instruction uh, cache and uh, these instructions are decoded into fixed length micro operations also called mu ops and this is basically done to simplify the execution logic. So next, uh, these uh, the decoded micro operations are also cached into a structure called the micro operation cache or mu op cache in short. And whenever there's a hit in the mu op cache, it, it can directly bypass the fetch and decode logic, which is basically uh, uh, like uh, high latency and highly power consuming logic. And this, this leads to a performance improvement and power reduction. Yeah. So a little more detail into this prediction window concept. So uh, the first uh, figure shows that uh, uh, prediction window is basically a sequence of instructions and this uh, this prediction window is terminated due to the I cache line boundary. So a prediction window cannot span multiple I cache lines. And uh, the second figure shows that the prediction window can start at the middle of a I cache line. This is this basically happens because the previous prediction window ended in the middle of a I cache line and the third figure shows that the prediction window can end at the uh, middle of an I cache line and this is due to a predicted taken branch. So the key takeaway is that a prediction window can start and end anywhere in an I cache line and uh, this basically happens due to these termination conditions which are I cache line boundary and the predicted taken branch termination conditions. So yeah, a little more detail about. Uh, uh, Simon, yes, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, so, yeah. but branch predictor works on uh, the instructions in the I cache, or branch prediction works on the micro ops. Because then, if you are telling yeah, that the yeah, branch predictor is, will give you the, the target. This is the I cache line. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, the branch predictor feeds the addresses into the I cache. I cache, right? So this line that you have connected here to the micro op cache, right here in the slide number eight is set eight, yeah. Yes. So yes. how do you explain that? No, no. Like uh, the address, the range of addresses are pro. I mean, uh, fed into the in instruction cache as well as the micro op cache. And if it is a hit in the micro op cache, then this uh, fetch and decode logic is bypassed, and the micro ops are directly dispatched to the backend. Okay. And in case there is a miss, we go to the normal path of instruction cache and decoder. Okay, okay. So are you going to discuss in regards to how the micro cache gets filled ahead in the presentation? Yes, yes, yes. We okay. will discuss that. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, that's what we are going to discuss. Uh, yeah, so this is a prediction window and uh, 
these instructions are decoded one by one and the decoder produces a set of mu ops for a particular instruction and yeah these instructions are uh, accumulated in a structure called the accumulation buffer and whenever this termination condition happens and in this case which is a predicted taken branch this uh, these micro operations are uh, written into the uh, basically the micro op cache and as you can see this is a micro op cache entry and and this is a, a particular micro op cache line and so the key takeaway is that due to the prediction windows the micro operation cache whenever there's a termination condition the micro operation cache entry is written to the micro op cache and uh, yeah the entry is basically a set of micro ops uh, corresponding to a set of instructions and uh, the key takeaway is that a micro op cache entry may not occupy the entire micro op cache line right so uh, this was the basic like uh, introduction of uh, mu ops and mu op cache and yeah so let's look into the impact so uh, why can't the cache entry fill the entire cache line what is the reason for it yeah this is because of these termination conditions and this termination conditions are basically uh, in place to like simplify the invalidation logic of the cache so uh, these are the uh, 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 micro ops uh, like accumulated for this particular prediction window and whenever okay, so the whole prediction window only one cache entry is been there yes yes okay yeah so uh, let's look at the impact of micro op caches like the performance improvements and power reduction Im improvements yeah so let's look at a, at a particular benchmark and this is basically the gcc ben benchmark so the baseline is is a micro op cache which can support 2k micro ops which can fit 2k micro ops and uh, like we increase the mu op cache size by multiples of 2 and the last uh, last bar shows a uh, micro op cache with a 64k micro ops and as you can see like uh, there is there is almost 25% performance improvement uh with the uh, larger micro op cache and about 40% uh, decoder power reduction and yeah so the key takeaway is that our average upc improvement upc is basically the number of micro operations committed per cycle which is a proxy for performance improvement is about 11.2% for uh, a 64k mu op cache and the average reduction in decoder power consumption is about 39.2% and and these numbers are basically huge so like uh, uh, micro op caches are, are like uh, very important for performance improvement and power reduction so what can we do next so the first uh, like uh, option is to just throw hi uh, uh, suman sorry yes. to interrupt uh, yes. can you go to the previous slide so here when you said 2k 8k 32k yes. are these number of entries in the cache or this is the size uh, these are not the entries as well as not the size uh, uh, if if you remember like we discussed a single mu op okay so uh, uh, an op cache can store 64k mu ops okay 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 understood right. cool. okay. yeah so uh, so the first like uh, uh, thing we can do is just throw money at the problem and increase the mu op cache size to like uh, get performance improvement and power reduction but uh, that's like uh, and the second option is to optimize the current mu op cache design like find the inefficiencies of the current design and try to optimize the cache design and yeah that is basically what the paper tries to do hey sumon yes uh sorry maybe i didn't get it what exactly is the problem here no the problem i mean we, sorry we have not uh, come to the problem yet like we want to improve performance and decrease uh, power uh, like uh, further on power. top on top of what is uh, achievable Yes, yes. Like we saw in this figure, that uh, if we increase the mu op cache size, we can get this amount of uh, improvement. So uh, one uh, one option is to like uh, increase the op cache okay. size. Got and, it. Got it. Got it. And the second option is to optimize the current design, like uh, the small cache with two k entries. Mm -hmm. Got okay. it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, so before before like. 
uh, trying to optimize the cache, we need to find the inefficiencies of the current design. So this is basically the motivation. Yeah, so note that the uh, MUOP cache line size is 64 bytes, and we saw that uh, not every, uh, like, uh, the MUOP cache entries does not fit the whole cache line. So from this uh, plot, we can see that about 72% of the MUOP cache lines are highly fragmented. That is, the MUOP cache entries are, are uh, less than 40 bytes size. So, like, uh, and the main reason for this is the termination conditions that we saw. And uh, so let's discuss more about these termination conditions. Uh, Suman, uh, what is the size of a micro op? Uh, yeah, I don't exactly know that, but uh, like they define the size in terms of the number of mu ops it can hold, which is 2K in this case. Uh, there was the, no, no, I think uh, his question is different. The size of the micro operation itself, the micro operation in instruction. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, that's uh, 56 bits. A single mu. But that can be different, right? It's a. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no. no, no. We we use uh, fixed size micro. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the only difference. Around eight bytes then. Yeah, around eight bytes. So the only difference uh, that we can say is uh, one is uh, 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 different instructions will have different number of micro ops, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say that the uh, cache line size in a micro op cache is 64 bytes, so uh, in 64 byte cache line size, we can't essentially cover a 64 byte cache line of uh, i cache, right? No, no, no. This is micro op cache. We yeah. are not talking about i cache. So only the Termination conditions in the instructions which actually give us the uh, branch divergence or anything. Those yeah. uh, micro ops we are planning to save and uh, their target addresses wherein we can jump directly, right? Mm, yes, yes, kind of. We'll discuss right. more. We'll discuss more. Okay, uh, I I have a data point here. So if uh, the cast line is fragmented mm -hmm. in the micro cast, yes. Why to use sixty four byte? Okay. Could you elaborate? Yeah, my, my question is why to use a cache line size of 64 byte if 72% uh, of the cache line is anyway getting fragmented? That's actually what the paper is going to solve. Uh, so like actually some of the uh, entries are almost got like it, got it. So why, why not have a you know flexible cache line size? I can go for 16, 32, 64 dynamically. Uh, not 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 like that, but the paper is going to solve this problem in a different way. Yeah, in a different way. That would be, I guess, more complicated and power hungry, maybe logic. Be logic. Okay. Yes. Okay. Maybe Piswa, is it something to do with uh, we already having infrastructures ready for transferring 64 bytes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The 64 byte is a limit throughout the. Yeah, they consider the baseline as a cache with this structure, and they try to improve this cache. Yeah, but what uh, as a design choice, you can actually go for smaller cast line size. Yeah, anyway, yes. it's an open question. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's actually a good question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the main uh, we look into the main sources of fragmentation, which are the termination conditions. And the first is the I cache line boundary termination condition. And basically, uh, so we can see that uh, these two like uh, blocks are sequential, and because of this I cache line boundary, these these uh, 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 this entries are mapped to different MUOP cache sets, which basically like leads to smaller MUOP cache entries and hence lower uh, MUOP cache utilization. And uh, going to the second uh, termination condition. Uh, similar to the first, the MUOP cache line is terminated by a predicted taken branch and uh, again smaller MUOP cache entries and low MUOP cache utilization. And there are few other conditions, uh, which is the maximum number of immediate slash displacement fields uh, allowed in a particular cache line and uh, the maximum number of microcoded instructions per cache line. Like, yeah, these are some additional conditions apart from the prediction window termination conditions. Uh, yeah, Suman, so. uh, I have a question or query. So yes. if I'm getting a taken branch, 
uh, yes. because of which my microbe cast line is getting fragmented. Mm -hmm. Why can't I store a pointer to the target microbe in the same cast line? Yeah, we can do that, but that won't like uh, improve the utilization of cache, right? Because the uh, uh, cache line will be half empty. I mean, just for example. No, from from uh, front end perspective, mm -hmm. what what happens if you don't store the micro followed by a taken branch? Basically, uh, it's a miss, right? Uh, no, suppose uh, say uh, there is a prediction window A and uh, which jumps to another like basic block B, uh -huh. right? So uh, the basic block B will be another uh, can be present in another micro of cache. Okay, right? okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. But the uh, entries are fragmented. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we went through this. So the definition of your basic block is from where you start. Uh, yes, uh, prediction uh, window. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. so these are the solutions proposed to fix this fragmentation problem. And uh, yeah, the first one, is which is which basically targets the first termination condition, I cache line boundary termination condition. And the second pro uh, solution is compaction which tries to address the other termination conditions. And uh, there, uh, th the paper proposes three different uh, techniques of compaction, which are which are this. We'll, we will discuss this later. Uh, any questions? I think we have taken a lot of questions, so should yeah, I move proceed? On, move on, move on. Okay. Okay. So yeah, this is the first uh, solution proposed. Just to reiterate the problem, uh, the first termination condition, I catch line boundary and uh, yeah, this red, red block is just another example of fragmentation due to this termination condition. So what this uh, like this class uh, tries to do is just it merges these two uh, uh, mu op cache entries into one mu op cache entry and uh, this it basically tries to do by uh, relaxing the I cache line boundary termination condition and uh, it, it only does it in case of sequential codes uh, in order to like uh, uh, simplify the invalidation logic and uh, yeah as uh, two entries are merged into a single entry the di dispatch bandwidth is also doubled because instead of one we uh, uh, send two micro op cache entries to the back end so this is basically the first solution which is clasp and uh, as you can see from this plot that about 35% of the MIOP cache entries are merged by this technique. So moving on to the uh, next problem, uh, the uh, next termination condition, as we saw this uh, predicted taken branch termination condition, and uh, this plot shows that about 49% of the MIOP cache entries are terminated by this predicted taken branch termination condition, which is like huge. So we need to address this problem. So what compaction basically tries to do is just uh, compact two uh, unrelated entries into a single micro op cache line. And uh, yeah, this is what basically it does. And it targets the uh, termination conditions other than the I cache line boundary condition, which is handled by the first solution clasp. And yeah, this is a, a, a point to note that the entries are like not merged together into a single entry because they are uh, kind of unrelated and they are not sequential and uh, the, the uh, compaction just basically uh, compacts these two entries into a single cache line. That's it. So uh, that is the reason the dispatch bandwidth remains the same unlike clasp and only the it addresses the fragmentation issue. So the uh, most uh, like uh, the biggest challenge with compaction is that which micro op cache entries we will compact together, right? Because uh, there are a lot of factors like replacement policies working in cache, and we sort of want to uh, merge together entries which are related temporally or spatially or something like that. 
So this is um, the most important challenge and to address this, the paper proposes the three solutions. So the first compaction technique is replacement aware compaction technique. And uh, yeah, note that all the compaction is done at the time of micro operation cache fill whenever uh, uh, entry is filled into the cache just to like simplify the compaction logic. And yeah, so this entry X is the uh, new entry that's uh, ready to be filled into the cache. And before compaction, this is the state of a particular cache, MIOP cache set. And what this uh, method tries to do is basically it compacts the new uh, entry with the MRU line, which is the most recently used uh, cache line. And uh, this uh, it does because it ensures that the MIOP cache entries are temporarily temporarily correlated. Yeah. The, uh, compaction technique. The prediction. Used and the simple replacement aware technique is used. So uh, the entry from prediction window B, this is the new entry and it is compacted with this line, which is the MRU line. And in case uh, the this PVAC uh, compaction technique is used, it forces the uh, the uh, MIOP cache entry from prediction window B to compact with with uh, uh, entry from the same prediction window. So uh, yeah, this is what basically PVAC does. It attempts to compact new MIOP cache entries with entries from the same prediction window. And uh, yeah, this is the last uh, uh, compaction technique, which is forced PVAC. And uh, this is basically done because the PVAC does not always work in all cases. And let's look at an example to understand why. So this is the new entry, which is ready uh, uh, entry from prediction window B. And uh, there is just only one line which can accommodate uh, a new entry. So this is uh, compacted with this line. And uh, at a later point of time, another entry from prediction window B comes. And as there is no like uh, empty space in other lines, we, we have to like put it into a new line in case uh, of PVAC or RSE. So uh, what this forced PVAC does is it basically forces out this uh, uh, entry from the other prediction window into a different line and compacts the uh, uh, entries from the same prediction window into a into the same cache line. So these were the uh, three uh, compaction techniques which this paper proposes. And uh, yeah, this plot shows the uh, like the uh, distribution of the compaction techniques and uh, yeah, just to note that all three compaction techniques works simultaneously and the usage priority is as follows. The PVAC is uh, preferred first and uh, the uh, replacement of our cache technique is uh, compaction technique is the least prioritized. And as you can see, there is almost equal distribution of all the compaction techniques used. Yeah, so. Uh, Let's move on to the evaluation and uh, yeah, this is the evaluation setup and the key takeaway is that the baseline MIOP cache fits 2K micro operations. And yeah, this is the performance improvement. As you can see, uh, like uh, the performance improvement with all the techniques working together, class plus compaction is about 5.3% uh, and the baseline is without any of these techniques into use and uh, the power reduction is about 19.4 percent with all the uh, techniques uh, being used together. Yeah. So uh, finally to conclude uh, the paper tries to uh, paper identifies that the micro operation caches are highly fragmented due to the termination conditions as we discussed and it uh, introduces this class technique which reduces fragmentation by relaxing iCache line boundary termination condition. And it also introduces compaction, which reduces fragmentation by joining possibly unrelated MIOP cache entries to improve performance and uh, to reduce decoder power consumption. 
Yeah, so thank you. Any uh, questions? Yes. Uh, when you are compacting two micro clients, right? I would like to know how do you take care of these pointers and all? Because now when you have decided to compact, huh, yes. they otherwise would have been two different entries. Yes, yes, yes. So they will have two different tags. Now the tags would essentially, you would have some common tag to see both these entries. For example, in this slide number 29, OC entry one and OC entry two have to be pointed out using the same tag. Uh -huh. So how do you probably access OC entry two? Now how hmm. do you know which yes. to access? I, what to access? I get your question. It's a actually good question. And uh, like just to like uh, avoid a lot of details, I skipped it. So basically compaction uh, compacts to unrelated entries right they are not sequential in nature so what it basically does is for each uh, cache line it maintains two different tags that's it simple so your tag size will increase yes yes so you, the en energy to identify the micro op inside the cache will increase yes yes yeah. but, but but it can uh, be done in parallel yeah, it ah, can be so in parallel, and uh, we only allow uh, like two maximum two entries to compact together, so it's not very high. So probably when you are trying to do two comparisons in parallel, so you are actually doubling the hardware straight away required for comparisons. Yes, true. That and is actually one of the discussion points. And then the you still they still come up to say that uh, they are reducing the power consumption. <laughs> yeah, because uh, whenever there is a hit, uh, the decoder is very power hungry, right? So we can okay. uh, we can bypass the decoder. So yeah, in overall amortized, it's it's getting performance improvement. Eighteen point four percent. Okay. No, no. So the, the point is this plot shows the reduction in decoder power, not the overall front end power. Yes, yes. Decoder power. Yes. Ah, so the, the, that's a <laughs> yeah. tricky way of projecting, right? <laughs> yeah, probably. I just wanted to point out this fact. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, all, you usually point out all these things, man. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know why, but I generally have this attitude of reading a paper from a critical perspective to push the boundaries. <laughs> Sorry for that. If I'm no, 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 no. This is a pretty valid point. Did they, did they mention about the you know an entire CPU power or front end power at least? Uh, they say uh, the UPC micro ops committed per cycle. They say that it's a. Nahin, nahin. that's the performance. Front end we are, performance. We are talking about power. Yeah, power. Ne, no, no, no. They just talk about decoder. Power. See, it's like you know, I I improve the power consumption by fifty percent in one of the micro architecture structure, mm -hmm. but in another structure, I increase it by let's say two x, right? Just for an example, right? Yes. Unless you show the end-to-end -end picture, uh, yes. this numbers will be inconclusive. Mm -hmm. That's actually a limitation. It it may turn out that you know by overall it's not a big deal because uh, multiple the micro, comparison the is just the cache is very small, so that is a point. Yeah, and that too you you, you just need comparators, right? If you are comparing two tags, that's all. Yes, so yes. yeah, it's not a big deal, but but still, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And Suman, I just wanted to know. Are... Okay. Uh, oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Like actually, uh, the main problem in the entire original design as well is that the decoder is consuming the maximum amount of power. Got it, so got it, got it. You know, we, we agree with the authors and we agree with the presenter. <laughs> no, but it's a valid point. They they don't show an overall power reduction. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Suman, I actually wanted to know, have they uh, discussed anything regarding increase the number of levels of micro cache? The reason why I'm asking is by They're fragmentation, if you are able to take uh, performance benefits, that essentially means by having more entries, you are able to gain benefits. Why can't? Why don't we just what? have multi-level caches for mm. micro cache then? Uh, yeah. Sorry. What do you mean by increasing the levels of the cache? Multi-level cache hierarchy. Okay. Okay. Like okay. we have this data cache, L1 I cache, L1 D cache, the L2 LLC. Like that, why can't we have multi-level cache hierarchy for micro cache dedicated? 
yeah we can do that but as we discussed like, we can increase the way of cache size which also increases performance and reduces power but basically it tries to optimize the baseline it's 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 trying to optimize the area yes yes the, the area it, budget the fragmentation yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. we can do that yeah i and uh, that should increase power and uh, increase performance that that will happen eventually in a yes. few years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that can be orthogonal to this proposal, right? Yeah, yeah. Along with yeah, multi level, we can use this also. Yeah. There, there are several proposals which are uh, orthogonal to this proposal. There is also another proposal that you can compact the mu of cache entries and like uh, like compress IS level instructions to expand the scope of compaction. But like they're focusing on uh, this aspect. No, but uh, like if we uh, have a multi-level MUOP cache, like uh, we are using the MUOP cache to uh, bypass the fetch and decode stage. But if we use multi-level MUOP cache, then again latency will be an issue, right? You can, you can probe parallelly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In in fact, uh, all the modern processors they actually probe multi levels of uh, cache hierarchy parallelly. Textbooks don't say that, but they do actually. Mm -hmm. That's quite interesting. Yeah, another point I want to discuss is that like they don't give a proper reasoning as to why the prediction window aware uh, compaction technique. Uh, should be prioritized over the replacement aware compaction technique. Like, uh, uh, we can understand that uh, entries from the same prediction window, like, uh, are more related, but they don't give a conclusive evidence to that. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yeah, overall it was a really good presentation. Yeah. With, with full of insights and uh, the presentation flow was really cool. B by the way, j just to ask a uh, question from security side, can you mount a side channel attack on micro? Yes, 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 yes. There are some yes, there are side channel attacks. Yeah, there are some papers yeah. around, around, about it also, yeah. That I know. I have read a ISCA 2021 paper that actually yeah. tries to, you know, uh, do it. But it's not that simple, yes, right? Because in traditional CAS, as a software or as an attacker, you have the control to send requests to a particular set, right? Mm -hmm. But here you don't have that luxury, right? I don't know which set number my micro of will end end up into as a attacker, as an attacker, right? So anyway, but but yeah, it's possible. People have done it. <laughs> OK, so let's move on. Yes, one. Yeah. Oh, another micro, is it? Yes. Okay. So today's lecture should be micro lecture. Then. Anyway, yeah, go on. Hi everyone. I am Ashwin Kumar. I am from Sleep Ten. Today I would like to give a presentation about the paper characterizing latency, throughput, and port usage of instructions on Intel x86 micro architectures. First, this is the flow of my presentation. Next, we would like to like. Why do we need to characterize the micro architectures? What is it the need of it? And how does it help to us by characterizing them? Uh, the first thing is the precise documentation for each of the micro architecture for a core processor is not available by the manufacturers. And also the high level implementation details of a core processor is available, but the lower level details like how an instruction is decoded into micro architecture mi micro operations and which ports does it use and so on and also there are there is no accurate information documented which is documented on the latency of each instruction there is a each instruction and also 
we have there is no an automatic machine readable information which can be useful in providing the performance benchmarks and we look at the background of this work as i have said earlier there are some of the tools or the tools which perform the architectural micro architectural which give the micro architectural view of the core processor one of them is intel's iesea it stands for intel architectural code analyzer it is an it is developed by the intel to get the to get to know the details about the micro architectural details of a core processor but the main thing is it shows only for the commonly used instructions like move operations and also it takes the code snippets as kernels and the major drawback of this is it does not take into consideration of the memory related instructions and also it is not updated frequently as the a new architecture is released from time to time and also from one of one version to the another version of iesea uh, in the one ver in the er if the earlier version has an data of of a such a, of an one instruction containing latency throughput information for the same instruction in the another version due to bug fixes which are undocumented the information is changed this is this is like dynamically from changing from one version to the another version of the iesea the main is the pipeline of the intel core cpus uh, it contains three three stages the first stage is front end stage and the next stage is execution engine and the memory unit in the front end stage the instructions are loaded into instruction cache and they are de they are decoded in the front end stage after performing the instruction decode those are sent into the reorder buffer reorder buffer is also like a register which performs which performs some of the operations like uh, exor of an register with itself and also no operations these are zero latency operations and after uh, there may be some instructions which are which consumes the alu unit those are sent to the scheduler to schedule them and scheduler assigns the ports uh, on their respective instruction in this diagram like there are six ports for the alu and the scheduler assigns the instructions into six ports yeah uh, for every core processor there are there are some addressing modes in this work they have used only the immediate mode addressing mode register mode register indirect mode and direct addressing mode they have not taken into consideration of the displacement or relative and auto increment modes in this work they have done the immediate mode is like giving the data in the instruction itself while in the case of register mode addressing the data the data of the operand is in the registers and in the register indirect mode instructions the register contains the address location of the operand to which should be transferred to the hey i, I guess so everyone knows about the addressing mode okay. uh, okay, okay, yeah no need to you know explain okay. each and everything yeah like as i have said earlier uh, the paper deals mostly with the throughput port usage and the latency uh, there are so many definitions to characterize what the latency mean throughput and the port usage the common definition is the number of clock cycles that a core requires to complete all the micro operations of an instruction this is the common definition but according uh, as we look at this common definition uh, for a uh, pipeline cpu for which consists of five stages if we take the instruction i uh, to the latency of this this instruction will be of five cycles since uh, the instruction fetch is completing in the one cycle and the execution of that instruction is completed by fifth cycle so the latency will be five cycles according to this common definition but according to the paper they have the defined the latency in a different way they have considered the set s and d which 
stands for set is of source operands and d is for destination operands and the latency of a function is a mapping function from source to a destination operand uh, by finding the time execution time required to required for which the source will be ready until the destination is ready in that way they have defined the latency and next uh, the definition of throughput according to intel uh, throughput is defined as the number of clock cycles we need the processor might to wait to accept the same instruction again uh, but uh, according to another researcher the parallel work done by the agner fog he says that uh, it is the average number of clock cycles per instruction the the present authors have used these the definition given by the agner fog in the initial state of the paper they have say that they say that the agner fog definition is gives the higher throughputs compared to intel but they have used this the same definition to carry out their work and next we look at the third term in the paper that is port usage the port usage stands for to execute an instruction there are uh, it requires some of the ports that set of ports are called as are defined by the port usage Uh, let us assume that there are p number of ports in a core there may the number of combinations possible will be 2 per p that will be mapped to total number of instructions n the a set of port usage pc is defined as the number of ports it requires to complete the execution of one instruction to find the port usage they have defined a, a word that is blocking instructions a blocking instruction is an blocking instruction is defined for a set of ports in which uh, in which the blocking instructions they use the only ports which are defined on the sets on the set of port pc but not the ports other than pc such instructions are called as blocking instructions for that set pc uh, as uh, those are the definitions next Uh, they have proposed the algorithms to find out the latency throughput and the port usage first we will be looking at the uh, how to find the port usage as i have said earlier to find the port usage we have to find the blocking instructions to find the blocking instructions the in the first it consists of two steps in the first step uh, all the single micro operation instructions are run in the isolation mode and they have grouped into several groups which uses the same set of ports in the next stage the all the from the each group a instruction is taken which has higher throughput and such an instruction is called blocking instruction for that respective group after finding the blocking instruction uh, this port usage algorithm is run it mainly consists of three parts in the first stage all the port combinations are sorted in the size of their elements and next after sorting the port ports by their size of elements the algorithm determines number of micro operations it requires on each instruction and if there are uh, if there is a similar subset of that micro operations required then those micro operations are uh, subtracted from the previous set in the next step step if the if the micro operations are also subset then there are those are subtracted or if it is if they are not subset those are added to the micro operation list for that combinations and next uh, the measurements on hardware these are these measurements are done with the help of hardware performance counters on each processor these are done to evaluate whether the their work is accurate or correct with the hardware performance counters like uh, in the it consists of 11 11 steps normally in the first state uh, they will be saving the state of the program and disable all the interrupts and then serialize the instruction this serialization is instruction is done to 
not to lose any of the data and also to make sure that all the instructions are executed line by line not parallelly and at the initial and the start stage the value of the performance counter is read and noted down and then asm code is the instructions for which we want to find the latency part uh, and it is run and then serialized and at the end of the execution uh, the uh, the time of the performance counter is noted down and next the difference between the two values what we have noted down gives the latency for that instruction and interrupts are enabled and the state is restored in the next state yeah next we look at the latency to define the latency i have st stated earlier there there may be two possible cases in the first possible case uh, the source operand and the destination operand are of both are of same type in which and they are they are of explicit registers and and the instruction does not write to the same register and read at to the read from the same register at the same point of time uh, we can find for such an instruction we can find the latency by uh, running the uh, making a dependency chain by executing it and then uh, taking the runtime divided by the length of the chain there may be some cases in which there is no explicit register operands or the both the operations uh, both the operations are done in the same instruction we will look at those such of instructions this is one of the type like register to register move operation uh, uh, some of the previous works have used to find the latency they have used move or move zx instruction to find the latency of this type of instructions but the case is on some of the micro architectures it shows zero latency which says that uh, the instruction is executed in the reorder buffer itself but according to intel's manual or so the it requires some of the ports and it is being done in the alu part but if you take the this work uses move sx instruction to create the dependency chain and the latency is found out for such type of instructions next uh, movement of data from memory to register operation register in this case the instruction performs the movement of data from an address location in which the register has address itself from where the data is to be loaded and it is the register itself is modified the dependency chain is created for this and the by applying the previous formula latency is calculated and next the to find the throughput for finding the throughput of an instruction uh, we have to find out the a sequence of instruction which of all which avoids read after write dependencies there may be some cases in which we cannot find uh, we cannot find a sequence which avoids read after write dependencies uh, for such a cases uh, it is being defined in other way uh, for cases which have which avoids read and write after dependencies the sequence of instructions are executed several number of times the execution time of the sequence or the several repetitions is noted down and divided by the number of instructions in each sequence then it gives the throughput but according this is according to the definition given by the agner fog the parallel work they have used that thing next we look at the implementation and results hmm. uh, here we can see the uh, results they have performed the those experiments on the architectures from nehlm to skylake and they have taken while calculating these percentages they have taken isea as reference and uh, the is here it shows the isea version on which the it supports like on which on which version such architecture supports yes uh, one what are the insights there is no need to yes, go sir. through each like, and everything okay. Okay. so what, what's the, the insight from the table the main insight is like uh, what they have found out is the nehlm architecture isea 
it shows like what do i say it's some of the instructions it shows different latencies that's the main insight no the, that doesn't show up in this table yeah. right yeah yes like i have shown in the next slide yeah so this slide has no takeaway then <laughs> the tabulation itself okay then move on because this numbers won't make any sense unless you reason about it Uh, as I have said earlier, they have done also hardware measurements with the help of performance counters, and mm, this is comparison with hardware measurements and the IACA. Uh, uh, both have IACA shows most of the inaccurate information, and also it is not very frequently updated. For example, we take an instruction like that is test memory comma register. Uh, IACA is documented. IACA shows it as it uses one micro operation for store address and one micro operation for store data. But actually, this instruction does not perform those operations and it does not write to the memory. This is one of the differences with hardware measurements and IACA. And next, uh, the major results from this work is of AES on AES latency of AES instructions. These are not documented by any other previous work. Uh, it shows that uh, the the work have measured a latency of six cycles, which is less than two cycles. The latency compared to Intel's manual. Uh, this is due to the fact that uh, the in the in the sorry, in the sixth line they have used the round key register, uh, but it takes only one latency. Oh, in the first in the first stage it takes four lat four cycles of latency and in the second state it takes one cycle of latency total rounds to six cycles of the latency yeah and next instruction they have done on the aes part is shld instruction this performs this accesses uh, register r1 as write and r2 as read and imm as read operation According to Intel's manual, it has a latency of three cycles, but uh, the measured latency of is was three cycles when R1 and R2 both are different. If R1 and R2 both are same, then the latency is of one cycle. Next, this is also one of the in which the port usage is differs from the Intel's manual. We have seen earlier the latency differences. This is for port usage. Uh, it is an instruction which moves an code word. Uh, it, it contains of two micro operations. Uh, the measured port usage was uh, for the second micro operation, port 0, 1, and 5 are used. But the IACA shows the second micro operation and the first micro operation uses only port 5. It does not say about whether the port 0, port 1, or details. Yeah. This is also the same, the different instruction of such yeah, you type. Can, you can move on. Okay. You can move on. Okay. Yeah. Next, we will be look at limitations and the proposed future work. In the limitations, the first thing is it supports only 64-bit instruction mode. And, and also, it does not support for floating point instruction sets and it does not have an, any details about system instructions like halt control writing a control or segment registers or so on yeah. uh, the future uh, work they have proposed is the extending the tool to amd x86 cpus and also in the decoder part uh, there is a comp they have they say that it may consist of a complex decoder, which is to be explored. Now I would like to, are there any questions? Hello. So you are done, is it? Sir, I would like to show the tool. Like I would like to give it to my team member. He will be showing that tool once. Can we? Showing what? What exactly will show? That tool tool like the tool, the tool for which is yes. I mean, there is, there they have developed it 
Yeah, yeah, that I got it. But what exactly you want to show? Uh, basically, what, I mean, how what is the installation and just the GitHub repository. Okay, how, how much time you need for that? A uh, couple of minutes, sir. Max okay, minutes. okay, okay. Then do that. Yeah, Virendra, can you give me an access? Virendra can't. I have to give you. Can you try now? Mm, yes, sir. No. Maybe Virendra, you can stop the recording. Okay, sir. So this, this is a uh, code repository. 